visible? Uh, is that uh, audible? Okay, good. Uh, currently, it's timing in. Uh, uh, this talk's to cut time in at about uh, twenty-five minutes. So. Okay, so this is the first talk uh, of a series. The aim is to uh, introduce people to precision time transfer. Uh, I've divided the topic into three areas. Today's this will allow people. Each each one should be interesting to an individual group of people. I've divided the topic into three areas. Today's talk is on GPS and time transfer. The second talk is about computer timekeeping, speci specifically under Linux. The third is a talk is about software choices and monitoring. Okay, so standard disclaimer, potentially with timing, bad things can happen. You can kill people, your company can cease to exist, whatever. This today's talks, uh, the focus of today's talk is about GPS for time transfer, not consumer navigation. However, much of the technical information is very much applicable to accurate navigation. Okay, the aim of today's talk is A, why you might need precision transfer, time transfer, and B, how in Australia GPS is your only option. So I'll start off by covering common timing needs, look at the future of GPS, then look at the, uh, your options when choosing a, a GPS receiver and why you need a pulse per second. I'll quickly cover any additional hardware and then finishing off by traceability requirements to UTC. So the first part of this talk is really about convincing people that precision timekeeping is important. The time on Apple phones and mobile devices are only guaranteed to the nearest minute. And due to the vagaries of leap seconds, on Microsoft platforms, time is only guaranteed to the nearest second. And some Android phones uh, have a bug where they do not apply leap seconds correctly. So why is su sub-second time keeping important? Many, many modern Record 3 frameworks uh, require accurate timekeeping as part of their audits and accounting functions. Similarly, for, if you're for all systems in this space, if your logs are to be legally useful, then they need to contain... <laughs> yes? Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. I've <laughs> for legal, uh, okay. So for system administrators, if your your logs are to be legally useful, uh, le <laughs> can I actually on? Well, I'm on. Yep. So Um, so if you, so if they're to be legally useful, you need to have accurate timestamps. Then we get into the vanity reasons. Time, precision timekeeping is a, an addiction. For legal reasons, I'm not going to advise slug on, on how to satisfy requirements. However, from an engineering perspective, it's often easiest to identify the, e uh, the most stringent re applicable requirements and implement these. So in, a, in the modern world, timekeeping expectations have increased. So here's a list of common timekeeping requirements. As you can see here, there's a great variation in the requirements. So you need to identify which is, applies to you. Okay, enough of the, the reasons for, uh, for precision timekeeping. Let's look, work on the mechanics. NTP is everywhere. Everything from the clocks on our railway stations to precision frequency transfer for radio transmissions. But with NTP over the internet, your accuracy is limited. You're limited to about the one, one millisecond is, is really pushing it. 
second, probably 10 milliseconds is probably closest. Okay. There are two main approaches of using uh, NTP. A simple one, which most people use, which is where your workstation periodically queries uh, an NTP server, typically from cron or from IFRP or Network Mangler. The alternative is to run NTP continuously and use internet queries to determine if your local clock is running slow or fast and allow NTP to correct to compensate. It's an additional step, and that's to use an, an external clock source, such as GPS, the key advantage of GPS are it's far more accurate than time over the internet, and the GPS can be used once a second rather than an internet query a couple of times an hour. Additional re use reasons for using an external clock include measuring asymmetric del delays, coping with 3G internet, uh, one second jitter on, on, on 3G connections is not, doesn't do NTP a lot of good. And the rest are about uh, not depending on someone else's NTP, uh, GPS. So if you're going to choose an external clock source, here are your options. But in Australia, there's only really one option. All the rest, long wave and short wave, are available overseas. They're not available in Australia. Okay, that's a long-winded bit of, of, of why precision timekeeping is important. Let's get on with the mechanics of it. Look at the wonders of, of GPS. GPS has the highest uh, precision period, it, and it's now ridiculously cheap. There's long been a, a feeling that the military uh, version of GPS is, is superior to the consumer uh, version. But high precision GPS is all about cost. You can have the military features if you're prepared to pay. But Moore's law is king here, and multi-constellation GPSs have recently become affordable. So what the military really cares about is anti-spoofing and anti-jamming. But a simple jam GPS signals are so weak that a simple jammer will completely obliterate all signals all GPS signals. So, selective availability is gone and, and uh, gone forever. And access to the military-only L2's uh, frequency has been introduced, <coughs> along with the new L5 uh, system. L L1C will be in the future. So what I'm trying to show in this slide is the GPS satellites are really expensive. They, they, uh, they s and they stay in service much longer than projected. At the bottom of the table, the important bits, you'll see that there are only eight of the satellites uh, support L L2C, and only one supports L5. L1C is on the, on the horizon. So GPS used to be a, have a monopoly. Now there's a whole raft of systems. Nec in the next year, there'll be uh, uh, there'll be big changes for it. It'll be big changes. The Russian GLONASS system fell into disrepair with the breakup of the Soviet Union, but has recently been re restored. The and that's being used by the iPhone 4, uh, 4GS. The Japanese Quasi Zenith system is a regional system, but it actually covers Australia as well. The first two Galileo validation satellites have been launched, and the Chinese intend to uh, go ahead with Compass. So in a few years, there will be over 100 satellites in, in orbit. The problem with all of these is that uh, receivers that support alternative constellations and are affordable, they've only just come onto the market, and many only support one system. So these, these receivers are not A, not mature, and B, are poorly documented. This is not what you need for time synchronization. So at the moment, L1 is your only option. Okay, here's the technicalities of choosing a GPS receiver. 
You need four satellites to get a 3D fix. Uh, so why are the 99 channel receivers available? In a couple of years with Galileo and, and Compass, sure, makes sense, but mod uh, current receivers can't receive these alternative constellations. So the GPS users are divided into tribes. Consum the consumer navigation is all about the user interface. Aviation, uh, each receiver must go undergo extensive certification before it can be installed. Land surveyors need hi uh, the highest precision. So carrier phase, dual frequency are used, and they cost 100,000. Uh, the final is uh, time receivers, and they just need to be as bug-free as possible. So GPS is based on precision time, but you need to get that into your computer. For this, you need a pulse per second. The, the vast majority of consumer receivers are not suitable for time transfer. A few that are su suitable include the Garmin models, and only these models. A new arrival is the Shure Electronics Kit. It's available cheaply from eBay. Patrick? One, one microsecond, yes, one millionth of a second. As said, the accuracy, that's, 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 that's a really pessimistic. So that's available for 30, $34 on eBay. Uh, three weeks later you get it. It's dead simple. Um, in fact, I'll pass around. Here, here are the things. So these are about, about the $300 mark. Uh, that's about $30. Yeah, uh, so somewhere. So the black one there is is uh, the Garmin LVC. Uh, sorry, the 16 HVC. The problem with it is that it's that as you can see here, there's a systematic error in it. Most of the time, it's in the centre. Some of the time, you're on the edges. So, rather than repurposing a consumer navigation receiver, another option is to, 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 to use a specifically designed receiver, such as a timing receiver. There are a lim really limited number of, of, of models available. The first three are available on eBay, the, the second hand. About about the thirty, uh, about somewhere between twenty and fifty dollars. Okay. Um, so for s for navigation, you can average your, your time, uh, your position. You can stay in the one position and get an a uh, and average the location over time and get a more accurate result. But time does not stand still. So a GPS DO uses a high uses a high spec oscillator to average the result, and you get preci a precision frequency source as a side benefit. These are two common uh, timing GPS receivers. On the left is the uh, Motorola M12. The um, small rice grain size thing there is a surface mount oscillator. The one on the right is a an ovenized crystal oscillator. Uh, the one on the right's a lot better. So, during a holdover, during a holdover, GPS DOs uh, can still provide a precision time source. So there's no need to fall back on a cr the crummy crystal in your PC. So, in reality, if you're not accurate to the nearest nanosecond, microsecond, whatever, then um, you're not really trying. While we're here, shit, sorry. <laughs> uh, little quiz. Does anyone recognise that? Oh, sorry. So uh, somehow there's a slide disappeared from that set. It's, that's one nanosecond. That's how long 
light travels in one second, about 30 centimetres. Yeah, one nanosecond. So it's an old Grace Hopper uh, 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 ploy. There was a slide up there for that. Um, so uh, in order to get the, a timing accuracy of several, several tens of nanoseconds, you need position accuracy of that as well. So you need to get your position, your, your precision, your, the precision of your GPS down to 30 centimeters. Okay, you've decided, uh, you've decided on which GPS receiver you want. Now I'll cover why G one GPS receiver might not be enough. I'll then cover other hardware such as antennas and then look at signal outages and the GPS signal. Sorry for the excuse the language on the slide. Uh, what I'm trying to convey here is the fear, the fear of waking up one morning and discovering all your that your receivers have turned into paperweights. And uh, that's a real possibility. So modern GPS firmware is written with the in the cheapest possible fashion. And it's difficult for an end user to, to test what will happen at a particular date or a particular situation. Every day has the magic of Y2K. If you're happy with, with one GPS receiver, at least check it against two uh, internet time servers. If you want to keep the higher precision, then you need at least three GPS receivers. NTP is Byzantine and can detect hardware failures. And hardware's cheap. In navigation mode, when the GPS receiver moves, the inter interference may disappear. In a static location, interference can be permanent. And even temporary architectures take, uh, NTP takes a long time to recover. So GPS has, has really become an essential service. Most mobile phone uh, and radio transmitters use, use GPS. And recently, jamming by North Korea caused the mobile base stations in uh, outages in South Korea. Patrick. Yes. So, uh, so no, GPS satellites actually uh, uh, travel down to about just underneath the Australian Bight. The the geostationary satellites that people are used for are used to for satellite TV all sit around above uh, in Australia above uh, PNG the GPS satellites move so that, that way if uh, they can, they can uh, change configuration so that you can get a be uh, better averaging uh, through the atmosphere. Is the, the, is the reverse true in the yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So, Yeah, I'm get, I'm, I've got a, a markup with the slide uh, with my slides. So here I'm here I'm covering what uh, what you do to hook up your new GPS, and warming up your soldering iron might be a good idea. A lot of pulse per se second uh, receivers that have a pulse per second have a, a use TTL serial. If you connect a, a TTL serial to uh, to your RS-232 in your, the back of your computer, you've got a reasonable chance of frying it. So another alternative uh, to G uh, the NTP everywhere is to use a distribution amplifier. This allows you to share a co uh, a one a number of computers to share a single GPS. This, and this is a lot more pr precise than NTP over the Ethernet. Last page. So let's finish off the talk. It, here is both a reality check 
and a look at how far you can soup up the time sink. So if the time on your consumer GPS is accurate, and that's a big if, then your consumer GPS is unlikely to be the uh, source of uh, uh, the major source of error, uh, of precision limit of precision to NTP. So here's a here's a source of the errors. As you can see here, the GPS sources are way below the computer measurement errors. If you need to prove the the specific time that an event occurred, then your local time needs to track an internationally legally agreed time scale, such as UTC, or which is UTC. But there's no real-time version of UTC, only versions for each contributing country. In the case of GPS, it's U uh, UTC UNSO, the U US Naval Observatory. So the GPS time scale is based on UTC without leap seconds, and as such it tracks TAI, but it's offset by 19 seconds. In order to give time relative to UTC, the GPS receiver must know the current leap second offset. This can take up to 12 and a half minutes, assuming you've got good re GPS reception, to receive. In order to to speed up the process, many designers take shortcuts, such as using the uh, UTC offset at the time the firmware was built until they've received the almanac. Even accounting f for leap second integer errors between GPS, uh, GPS and UTC, GPS is not the same as the time produced by standards organization. The, however, the diff Differences here are on at the nanosecond level. Okay, so that's the end. Fin uh, final point. In January, if I get my all my presents, there will be no more leap seconds. Please. Um, so currently, there are three nations that are against uh, against the removal of leap seconds: the U.S. and every and most Western nations are in favor of the removal of leap seconds. The three are China, Britain, and Canada. So China, apparently, it, it, will, uh, it will be bad astrological. Uh, uh, Britain, it's about GMT. They still haven't, they're still not getting over uh, GMT, the loss of GMT. And Canada was, uh, was involved with the GMT. That it's a standards vote. It's just like uh, it's just like um, certain things like climate change negotiation. We will get rid of leap seconds in the end. There is no choice about it. In about in about five hundred years time. Okay, in about in about a hundred years time. In in about a hundred. Okay, so. We're talking about Britain. Britain is actually about to move. Uh, there's a, a, a proposal. <laughs> yeah, will literally move onto the continent. They're actually about to, to move uh, time zone to the uh, to Central Europe. Are they? That there is a there's a mem uh, there's a uh, there's a, a bill in front of Parliament at, at the moment. People are quite used to to uh, uh, the time the time that the sun sets is doesn't the only people that really affected by uh, uh, by uh, leap, uh, leap seconds these days are the astronomers who need to know exactly where in the sky to, to point their well, no, to point their, 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 their uh, telescope in it look by the end of the century we're going to we're going to run out of uh, leap so currently there are two positions uh, there are two known positions for adding leap seconds. At January, uh, uh, January the 1st, just between January the 1st and December the 31st, and at July, uh, at the end of, uh, beginning of July, a lot of GPS receivers don't understand that, that they only think that you can ins uh, uh, insert it in, in January. 
there hasn't been a, a, an assertion um, at July for about just over 15 years. At the end of the century, we're going to be getting more than two leap seconds, uh, uh, the addition of more than two leap seconds a year. And so you're going to go, where do you put them? And then it's uh, then at the end of the next century, it's going to be more than four leap seconds a year. So you, there is a possible fallback of adding them in at March and uh, at the end of March and the corresponding, what's it, October. Um, uh, uh, there. No, none of the software around uh, can expect uh, expects that. So, no, but that's go that's going to be a, oh, it, it's going to take it, it'll take at least five hundred years uh, uh, to get up to one hour, and there's about a Sydney, for instance, has effectively a, leg a negative um, daylight saving. Uh, in comparison to Melbourne. Melbourne is much further along. When you consider that the, en the entire uh, China, uh, China, uh, country of China is under the one time zone. There's more. There's more to it than that. But yes. That's the, effectively. That's what is expect. Effectively, no. It'll be out in in 500 years. It'll be out by an hour. It's no. It's it's actually a. It's not a linear. But yes. Five hundred years. That's exactly, and as and that's exactly what's going to happen for in in Britain. That's exactly what's going to happen in Britain. That they're actually going to at the end of their daylight saving, they're actually going to, uh, they they're just not going to turn their clocks back. Well, the problem with it is that <laughs> it's not legal. It, it's not legal. You have a uh, you have a share trade on, on that. Yeah, so that's a, that's a sign function. That when it, at, that at least leap seconds that you know that it's going to be out by at least one second. You can you can go back and do it with the Google one. In that in that what's it? It's 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 accurate at the the at the midnight. It's Twelve or is it six hours? Uh, the smear is over. It's one. It's a, it's, a, it's a five. It's a five hundred. It's to get it to five hundred ppm. Um, I'm actually going to cover that in the next talk. On uh, the next talk is about p pulse per seconds and leap seconds. Okay, the biggest problem with smear, a smear is firstly it's not legal. It's what we used to have, called, they were called rubber seconds. Right. Rubber yeah. seconds for that time, it's not only just time, it's also frequency. It means that all of your radio stations will go off frequency for the, the time of the smear. Uh, so, uh, so uh, that's next talk. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to have the. I was hoping to have both of these talks done by the end of the year. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I had a relatively busy year. Um, so, one of the pr there there are lots of problems with leap seconds. Basically, it's software bugs. Everyone, 
in, in an ideal world, you'd, uh, we'd all, uh, for legal timescales, we'd all use TA, or well, we'd use a, a timescale that didn't have leap seconds in it. The problem with it is that most people who write laws don't understand these things and just put UTC. Things like Britain still uses GMT in by law. The point about it is GT, uh, GMT has not been calculated. G, GMT stopped in 1972. So for n since 1972, their clocks have all been stopped. So they, 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 they haven't even bothered to tip X over GMT with, uh, with, uh, with, with UTC. And they're not, they're not the same, and there is no, there is no equivalent of GMT in the modern time scale, uh, modern time scale. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> ba basically, most all any of the synchronous networks are, are clocked by an atomic standard uh, to stop to stop um, uh, Gus. Tell me, uh, it's uh, the uh, the um, uh, what are they called? Pack packet uh, where we have different links of different s of marginally different speed. Um, for some reason, it's not coming to me. So, so things like uh, SDH uh, uh, and Sonnet um, uh, that you need all of the links to be synchronized. Otherwise, what happens is that you you drop a uh, packet and therefore you potentially drop a call. Um, so, the comment about uh, uh, telcos using GPS, they, they clock all of their networks uh, down to the nanosecond level because if they get a, a clock shift by one cycle, they drop all their calls. Um, there's also frequency things. Anyway. Um, from the Queen and the British Government and the Empire, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, while, while I'm up here, uh, so I mentioned some of the GPSs. Here is one of the TTL-based uh, GPSs. Uh, if anyone's in, uh, in interested in playing with these things, uh, I've got these for ten dollars. Um, uh, please don't connect it to a to an RS two three two port. Sure. Okay, so and I said what I said was that uh, consumer G GPSs are typically spec for one microsecond. This is a really old spec. Almost all of them achieve much better than that because one microsecond, if you look at the wire example, is equal to 300 meters. I want my GPS in my car to be far more accurate than 300 meters. So they, they, you, they, they quote a really conservative spec. In reality, a GPS should be getting uh, around the 10 nanoseconds uh, basis. The but on it is most consumer GPSs have a sawtooth on them where that's the, the, uh, the, pe the graph with, with, the, the, with three peaks on it. Some of the time they're they're on in the centre. Some of the time they're in in, in the lobes, and even more of the or some smaller time they're actually two lobes out. So so I, I, I'm happy to, to discuss.
Yes. Yes. Over to you. Okay, so my last uh, month I talked about RepRap, which is a 3D printing uh, technique which extrudes various types of plastic. And uh, so I think I found some really cool videos that show this because they look fabulous. Um, well, they the ultimate ge geek toy, I think. Um, so we'll um, we'll roll on those. And, and we'll see how we go. Can I make it full screen? Okay, now this is a walk around of the uh, the machine. There are uh, what four motors involved? Um, one, two, three, four. Um, this is the third generation of the uh, this design, and uh, all of these green parts have been made on a machine of this type, and uh, and everything. Yes, yes, except for the, the steel parts and the electronics and the motors and things like this, which are referred to as vitamins. So we, we, we happy with that or we want to watch that again? Uh, actually, it's quite a bit smaller. The, the build volume is much the same. Uh, but the original machine, which was called Darwin, was a, uh, a much more uh, elaborate uh, machine. It had four lead screws in the corners, which raised the, uh, and lowered the whole mechanism. Um, now, I ne need to get back to my page. And this one here is of printing out of what one of these parts looks like being printed. <laughs> now, they're extruding this black plastic and the part isn't solid. It's, it's, um, it's filling the, the interior as just a, a mesh fill, which is um, um, faster and, and uses less material. Um, in some cases, people then fill them with epoxy to, uh, to stiffen them up. Now, I just love to have something like that printing out landscapes or, or, or models or, or, or something like that. And we've got one more. Have I got? And <coughs> no, I've lost my pointer. Okay. I I think I'm done. Thank you. I've 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 uh, I've lost my pointer and uh, but so 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 that's two out of three. The the next one is much the same, just printing this one, um, which is is no big deal. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't bring that one along, but yeah, okay. We could we could we could spend the rest of the night playing these. Um, uh, one, when I find a decent demo, I'll get a video of a 3D scanner, some of which are incredibly clever. Mm. It, a lot like the, with the, the wax process that the, the jewelers use. Yes. Modern, wa modern uh, wax scanners are pretty accurate. Yeah. Really? Because it's a thick resistance, so it's like a silk frame. 
Thank you. Oops. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, so and, and oh, thank you. Hello, does that sound all right? Okay, let's get underway. I'm gonna turn this on and let it boot in the background. Okay, so um, that that was a really cool talk, and the reason why it was cool in my mind was that. I just came back from um, the Open Source Developers Conference that ran all last week in Canberra. Fantastic conference. It's really good to see those, the OSDC guys um, put together something awesome. It's getting better and better every year. Um, and there was one talk there. Was one talk there that uh, Let me just bring up the site. Um, there are videos for most of the talks up now. You can actually watch them. Uh, let's see, I think it's view the schedule. And um, what, what you can basically do is, uh, let's see, let's skip the mini comms over the first two days. And then you can, for instance, look at the keynote by Senator Kate Lundy. You just click on it, scroll down a bit, and there's the video there. It's just YouTube, so once you start playing, you get an option to open it. In a, you, can, you can go to YouTube proper and watch it, watch it full screen. and stuff like that. Um, um, now one talk that I found especially interesting, which unfortunately there wasn't a video of because it was done during the conference dinner at Old Parliament House, is the DNet keynote by John Oxer. If you don't know John Oxer, he was a past president of Linux Australia. Um, he's done all kinds of um, really interesting things with hardware and free software and um, combining the two. Um, one thing that he, um, that, that he raised during the talk was uh, what the kinds of things you can do with these replication devices, your rep wraps, your maker bots, and, and that sort of thing. And he, uh, what he did was he made reference to, uh, let me see, sorry, it's a bit weird operating a laptop like this, but um, uh, where's Wikipedia? Anyone familiar with this? I'm assuming this is the article. Uh -huh. Okay, so some, some people know this as the M16. Um, the AF15, I believe, is the model av made available for hunting um, and various other sports, in inverted commas. Um, now, apparently in the, in the United States, you can buy every single piece of this weapon individually, apart from the main component, which is this bit here. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I don't know the first thing about guns. But... Yeah, it's the, bit, it's the bit where you plug in the magazine, it's got the trigger, it, it contains the, the, the main working components of the gun. Now, that you cannot buy because that's how they control the proliferation of these weapons. However, there have been... Um, there have been people who have used replication devices to make fully working copies of these. So imagine you could buy these pieces and then you've got a remaining bit, you just replicate it. Or you replicate the whole thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave you guys to think about that as just a thought. A <laughs> well, well, this apparently works. Um, Anyway, so I'll just, I'll was that a comment? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I, I strongly recommend go through, go through the schedule um, and um, if you see something that's interesting, um, by, by all means click on them. There are, there are a range, of, range of, uh, of cool talks there. Let me just highlight a few. There's Kate Lundy's keynote, which I just mentioned. Um, um, I hear, I think it was this one, was quite popular. Um, it's about mobile applications development. Um, and... Well, if you, look at, if you look at the one with three engines kicking... That, I was going to point that one out too. Evan's talk was quite good. Um, <laughs> video is already there. 
um, it's it's I suppose about open source in a from a bit more more of a business perspective. I, I actually wasn't wasn't at that one unfortunately. I, I do intend to watch the video though. Um, uh, if you're interested in governance, there's Pia Wars talk on on that. Um, again, I didn't see it. Heard it was very good. Um, this one I did happen to make. Unfortunately, I was working during the conference. I spent most of my time in the hallway, and I will have a comment on that in a moment. Uh, this one was particularly entertaining and informative, um, which was about how to make um, how to make useful um, touchscreen applications. Um, the title says Android, but um, about 90% of the talk applied to any platform, um, iOS, um, in my case, Sugar, that, that sort of thing. If you're interested in free software applications for Android, there, there's Andrew McMillan's talk. There is, um, I found this really useful. I think it's, uh, if that's going to load. Anyway, what, what F draw, ah, oh, here we go. If you are interested in using free software on your mobile device, um, F-Droid is kind of like an equivalent of the, it's, a, it's an alternate market. It's like the Android market, but everything there has a free software license for it. So what you're doing is that you, you go to his website, you click repository, you follow the directions, and essentially you download, a, um, you, you download an APK package for your Android device, you install it, and then you can, then you can just browse through all these, all these free software um, applications to uh, to install. Um, that's that's something that's kind of um, um, been a thorn in my side because I like to use free software and looking on the Android market, it's hard to find them. Um, you can do ser you can do keyword searches and hopefully the author has in the description of the product um, um, mentioned the license. They might include things like GPL or open source or something like that somewhere in the description. But there's no specific field that you can search on for, for license. Um, so yeah, give F-Droid a, give, give a try. That's, that's really good. Um, now, I said earlier on that I spent a lot of, lot of my time in the hallways um, because I, I was paid there to, I was paid to be there, basically, and, um, and, um, as, as part of my work. And what I discovered was th the best thing about these conferences is what's known as the hallway track. You've got, you've got these. Um, you've, you've got these talks going on simultaneously. There, there really should be another column down here saying hallway track because if you spend your time outside of the lecture theatres, you meet interesting people, you have interesting conversations, and that's what that's what conferences are really about. The talks are great. I recommend you know go to the talks. Uh, if you miss them, watch the videos. That's all well and good. But the real value comes in actually meeting people and and exchanging ideas. And um, I certainly got. I certainly got all kinds of really cool input and um, and um, uh, influences from from the conference. Uh, now, what I'll what I'll do quickly. Sorry, I just had some some notes here. Um, what I what I will do is very quickly walk through my talk, which is this one here. Now, I'll, I'll spare you the abstract. You don't need to watch it. The video is down there. That's me. Without us, well, I'm actually. Um, if you're familiar with the old Linux Australia T-shirt with the penguin in the Aboriginal dot form, um, fantastic design. Um, um, if lobby Linux Australia to make more, they're they're, they're the coolest T-shirts I've ever seen. Um, I, ha I I was wearing that. Uh, okay, so what I'll do is I shall open my slides and hopefully. LibreOffice will uh, behave. Uh, let's see. Now, I've given uh, um, I've given about half of this talk last week, so I'll skip through that stuff. Sorry, last month. And what's that going to do for me? Oh, whoops! <laughs> you got my. Uh, you got my notes, my speaker's notes. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Because the monitor preferences are switched around. And I lost my cursor. Uh, if I can switch these around somehow. OK, 
go back to here. Can I do it? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Um, so skipping skipping through very quickly, um, talking about one laptop per child Australia, of which I happen to be the engineering manager. You guys know that already. Um, slide one, nice and pretty. Uh, you've seen that video if you were here six months ago. Um, core principles of old PC, um, those five. Sorry, I'm sprinting through this because I do understand that we're short on time and we have more to do um, here at Slug. This is the last meeting of the year. Um, so th those are core principles under underpinning OLPC at a global level. In Australia, we've added two more. Um, we, take, um, uh, we take teachers very, very seriously. They're, they're the facilitators. They're the, um, they, they really organize the education for the children. Um, and the, lo the local community, they, um, well, the kids go home to their parents. They go home to their families. Education should not stop in the classroom. Um, uh, that was a nice quote that um, that was made in um, Parliament, a few federal Parliament, a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was um, that was done by uh, Rob Oakeshott, and uh, it was followed up a few days later by an article Rob Oakeshott um, wrote for the Australian newspaper, which went into even more detail. So th those links down the bottom. Um, uh, uh, go point directly to those. Um, this is a, this is a um, indication of some of the success we've had. We're not. I'm not going to claim to be um, um, some magic bullet that, that solves education in Australia. But uh, at at Dumaji State School in Queensland, uh, they they jumped in one year from 31% to 95% of Year Three pupils who who met the minimum standards of, of numeracy. Uh, Dumaji has done some really interesting things. They're they're a very clever school. But um, a key thing that they did was, was was very wholeheartedly take on the old PC Australia program. Uh, that's that's a map indicating some of the uh, well, most of the places where we've deployed. You'll see Dumaji there. Uh, I don't remember to be honest. <laughs> they they do mean something. I just don't recall. Uh, building sustainability. Uh, this is what I spoke about la uh, last month. We've got a series of certifications which are underpinned by a, an online course. We do not distribute XOs to teachers who do not have the appropriate training and who have not achieved the certification. Um, so that, that way we can, we can maintain some level of quality control. Um, by the same token, we want to we want to encourage sustainability because there's no way this works if we build a dependency. If we, um, it's one of those things where if your support structure is too good, then they'll just call you every time that there's a problem and they won't help themselves. So we we, we focus things very much on on encouraging people to learn for themselves. Um, to borrow an old expression, uh, teaching teaching a person to fish rather than just giving them a fish. Um, so quick summary: we've got the XO expert, which is uh, which is a teacher who's done, I think it's uh, 25 hours in a course, and uh, EXO certified is, I think it's 10 or 15. Uh, sorry, I'm going from memory here. Um, and EXO, ex the, the cool thing here is sustainability-wise is that the EXO expert can actually certify other teachers to be EXO certified. So then, and then they can use our materials, our educational materials to do so. Um, that, way, that way they're not dependent on us constantly to, to certify teachers. Uh, we also want to reward children who are involved in the classroom, helping their peers, helping their teachers, uh, parents, and so on, and to children who have who have um, uh, proven themselves. There's the EXO Champion certification, and that can be awarded by a teacher who's an EXO expert. Uh, similarly, on the on the technical side of things, there's the EXO Technician, which is more of an adult type certification for people who fix EXOs, and then. Um, there's a there's one one that's more child focused, which is Exo Mechanic. Uh, the Exo has been designed to be fully repaired and, and uh, maintained by children, so we we want to encourage that sort of thing. Um, Exo Ambassadors at the top. These are people who have shown themselves to be um, to be great spokespeople for the old PC Australia program. They understand it. They take on board the core principles very intimately, and they they're able to to impart that knowledge to other people. Uh, and there's also Exo Local, which is a a um, certification with a 
with an associated course to retain it that is um, um, that is focused on on local communities. Um, so any member of the community can can um, can go for this if they like. Uh, so those are some of the um, online uh, methods of support we have, um, starting with the education portal. That's where people start off. Uh, there's an online store if they want to more buy more parts. Um, and uh, the online course, which I was just talking about on the previous slide, is that there, laptop.moodle.com.au. Feel free to go and take a look. Uh, there's, there's free guest access if you, if you want to see the entire course. Um, there's, there's an online social network. We, um, a very important part of OPC is encouraging kids to, to collaborate online. The, the, whole, the whole structure of, of the Sugar interface um, uh, encourages and facilitates that. And likewise, we want teachers to be doing the same thing. So we've got an online social network. It looks and feels kind of like Facebook, um, and the um, the teachers can can exchange knowledge. And that, that's that's another way the teachers help each other rather than them con constantly coming to us and and feeling like um, you know we're their vendor. It's not a client vendor relationship. It's a it's it's a partnership. Um, we have a saying um, where we say us three before me. What that means is that we encourage people to ask their peers first before they ask the the authority, so to speak, uh, and and the authority again, so to speak, inverted commas is, is is the last point. So we do back them up if they do need assistance after they've exhausted all other opportunities. Um, um, they they can um, they can still call us. This is all Australian. I'm only talking about old PC Australia. I can't even I can't even comment that much about OPC globally. It's done so differently in different parts of the world, um, and what we do in Australia is very different. We we have to we tailor things to the Australian environment. Uh, so talking about technology, that's a motherboard for the uh, the current generation XO one point five device. Moving on, the XO. Hey, you know, you pretty much have all heard of it. It's a it's a Ruggedized learning device in the form factor of a laptop. Opens up. Whoops. Looks like that. Uh, the operating system. We've taken the old PC operating system and we've enhanced it and we've customized it. We've localized it. We've, we've picked, picked uh, activities and applications that are useful in the, in the Australian educational environment, going by curriculum and all of that. And we're, wor we're working hard to make sure that, that software is continually to be con continuing to be developed to suit the Australian curriculum and suit the needs of teachers. The USB is a means of distributing the, the operating system, the updates and so on. Uh, that picture there is what you get if you, if you want to order one from us, but you don't have to. It's just a piece of software. We've made it dead simple for teachers. You just, they just download a big zip file and extract it to a USB stick. And their way of getting software onto the XO is, is as simple as putting the stick in, turning it on. They get a nice menu saying, uh, giving, giving them a bunch of options like, do you want to flash your XO? Do you want to do some diagnostics and a few other choices? It's essentially a software Swiss Army knife for the teachers to do all kinds of stuff. And Patrick, you had your hand up. That is it. That is a USB wristband. Yes, um, and like I said, if they if they want to order one from us, we do we 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 do um, ship them like that. Um, but all you need is a one gig USB stick, and you can make your own. And that's that's what we what we encourage. Uh, XOP. That's this is our means of charging the XOs. It's a very efficient and uh, cost effective uh, charging rack. Uh, we've developed this in Australia. It works internationally. As you can see, it, uh, it looks like that when it's complete. The power bricks daisy chain to each other. And then you've just got a standard IEC kettle cable coming out the end. So you can keep daisy chaining up, up to, we, on an Australian electrical supply, you can get 50 XOs um, charging off one power point. And uh, that's something you can't do with traditional laptops because their power draw is too high. Um, they overload the electrical systems of the building and the school. Um, they, when they built 
typically when schools are built, they don't, they didn't think about these kinds of things. Even schools built, built 10 years ago, they, did, they didn't factor in the power draw of every child having a, a laptop. And this, this creates neatness, it's, it's, it's safe, it allows exos to basically sit on the shelf as if they're books. And that's what we want. We want them to be accessible, an integral part of the classroom. Kids can just pull them out and use them whenever they want. Uh, they, they've started to be used internationally. Uh, we use them extensively in Australia. That's, that's the way exos get charged. So all schools have one. Well, yeah, they, well, it's our design, they need to talk with us, and we have, we have had quite a few um, countries come to us and ask us about it. I don't have any more information than that, though. I can talk about the design, I can't talk about who's buying them. Uh, there are all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff, and the old PC wiki is full of, um, uh, full of, full of different implementations for charging XOs. Um, there, there are, um, do, there are do-it-yourself racks, you know, people, stuff people have hacked together with, with wood and so on. I, I've seen pictures of, I think it was in India, they had this means of charging exos by having cows draw some kind of pulley to charge them. Um, all sorts of things. The next generation exo, um, the 1.75, which um, should, be, should be reaching mass production in the next few months, that will actually be able to run off solar power. Now, just to just to emphasize the distinction here, there are a lot of things that can charge off solar power out there, um, but few things can actually run off solar. And the 175 has, such, has a, a low enough and predictable enough power draw that you can actually get a panel and expect the XO to keep running off it for, 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 for a good period of time. Um, um, they tend to write their names on them. That's what I've seen most often. Um, it, we, le we leave that classroom management up to the teacher because it's not for us to, to tell them what to do. And um, situations vary wildly across the country. And so in some schools, the XOs just are in a common pool and the child just pulls out any old one. In some cases, they're actually owned by the child and they write their name on it and whatever. That's the ideal we, we want to get to. We want, the, we want it so that the child actually owns the device, they're allowed to take it home, and then their classroom experience is not just confined to a physical room. They're learning whenever they want. They just pull out their XO and then they, um, and and they can do that outside because the XO is so rugged and it's got a sunlight readable screen and all of that stuff. Um, but it's up to the it's up to the teachers and the communities as to how they want to manage the XOs. Um, XSAU, it's software, so I don't have a picture. It's it's but. I thought of having a picture of a cloud or something like that, and I thought, nah, stop it, I'm too lazy. <laughs> um, that, that is, uh, it's, it, it's a server. Um, it, 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 it does lots of, lots of things, but the essential, um, its essential function is to facilitate the collaboration between the XOs. Something that the Sugar interface does on the e XOs is that they t the XOs talk to each other automatically over a network, and in fact, they can even create their own network. The first XO that pops up and goes, hey, I don't have a network that I can connect to, will automatically create its own, and the others connect to it with ad hoc. Um, but when you start doing things like that, you hit scalability limits, and for a, a larger network, it, it makes sense to start having a server. The communication be between the XOs is XMPP, which a lot of people know as Jabber. It's the same protocol that Google Talk use. Um, Facebook chat has, a, um, has an implementation of it. Uh, it's, it's very popular, it's used for a lot more than instant messaging. And, and in the case of EXOs, it's, it's used for, well in the case of Sugar, it's used for collaboration. One thing about Sugar is that it's not confined to EXOs. EXOs are a great showcase of Sugar because you can do a lot, a lot of stuff with them. But you can run Sugar on your normal computer. You can, you can install it on a standard Linux distribution, it's available as packages. You can run it inside a window, you can use it as a login session instead of your GNOME or KDE or, or um, Rat Poison or whatever. Window manager you're using. Try rat poison, it's cool. Localization. Uh, really important. We, um, um, not, um, education works best when it's contextualized, if you can actually relate to it. So we're, we're putting efforts into to, to work with local communities to, to make sugar, make the exos feel like it's part of, part of their culture.
No, we, fo we focus on children, but um, we do, um, well, adult ed education in the sense in the sense of teachers, teacher aides, community members, that sort of stuff. So actually, I'll take that back. My answer is yes, we do. Um, that's the, the certifications I showed before. They were the, they were the teacher certifications, EXO, EXO Cert and um, EXO Expert. There was also EXO Local, which is, which, which is something we've, we've made for the community members. I'm not sure what you're getting at, sorry. Oh, yes, yes, and that and, and that's that's why we have that's why we have certifications like Exo Local. Exo Local, what what is really cool about it is that it's designed with without an assumption of high literacy. Um, it, a lot of it's video based. They, it, you don't you don't really need internet much at all. You can go to your lo local library, and we'll make those um, we'll make the videos available for viewing offline. Yes. That, that's right. Um, we, we, we work really hard to make sure that the local community is fully on board with this because we don't want this to just be a school thing. We want the community to take this on so that the child can, can comfortably use their EXO wherever they are, uh, whether it be in the school, um, outside, with their families, or whatever. Um, and we don't want anyone to feel left out. That's, I, I, and, and I strongly believe that's the only way you can make an educational policy work. You can't just focus on a particular group or a particular place. You have to take everyone into account. And that's what makes it really, really difficult as well, to be honest. So an example of localization. Um, that's, that's a character from the Yongamata language, which is used in Northeast Arnhem Land. Um, uh, it's, it's in Unicode. Most major fonts have it. You, know, you look in your, you, you, you look in your uh, ti Times Roman or whatever in the Microsoft fonts, and you, you'll see it there. Uh, and so a lot, a lot of this stuff's already there. We just need to tap into it. Okay, so talking about the future, this is where things get really, really cool. Uh, the XO 1.75, I mentioned it before. Uh, this is what I this is the device I said before, which uh, um, that can run off solar. And the reason why I can do stuff like that is it's just a more efficient architecture. They switch to an ARM-based platform. Um, more specifically, it's the uh, Marvel Armada 610 platform, and it. Uh, it has had a, has a more predictable power draw. It has much b much more efficient um, wireless capabilities. Uh, it's just it's just a much more polished device. It's it's what it's the XO we've wanted all along. Um, some some extra some extra features in there include a uh, light sensor and an accelerometer. Um, I don't think it was. No, X X86 was chosen in the first place because there wasn't really an alternative. ARM was not in that market at the time. Uh, they weren't. They're already pushing the yeah, for smaller devices, not for laptops. Not for laptops. And the netbook market did not exist. And there's a lot of business considerations too. So maybe old PC, I'm not privy to this, maybe old PC went to, went to, um, uh, companies that, that used ARM technology and said, hey, let's work together, and they didn't have favorable business terms. I don't know, but when you're talking about volume, you need to have a good business agreement with the manufacturer as well. And at the time, the best agreement they came up with was with AMD. Um, after that, on the XO 1.5, it was with Bayer, and now they're working with Marvell. And that's going to be the same on the XO 3 as well, which is a tablet-only device. I don't think they wanted to get into semiconductor design. Yeah, but they are asking for half a dozen, half a dozen 
take it up with all PC. I'm all PC Australia. Patrick? Sorry, we can talk afterwards, but we're really short on time. But that's, that's, it, is a, it is a good question. I also get questions like, why, why don't you have um, an Itanium in there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I exa okay, I exaggerate, but the, you know, the, the latest Intel quad-core CPU, stuff like that. And you know, they, in, in, in different contexts, they, they, they do make sense. But um, making a device like this is a series of trade-offs, and what they came up with was the best compromise of everything. Performance and uh, perf performance, and a lot of the um, a lot of the priorities that you see in consumer devices aren't priorities here. Uh, the, the the highest priority is 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 this going to be educational? Then you get into um, power, uh, low power consumption, um, durability over a five year lifespan, um, things like that. The battery the battery lasts for five years, which is something you just do not see in the consumer world. Um, so the um, when it comes to performance and stuff like that, that's down at that's down at number six, at, at least. Uh, yep, Patrick, we're running out of time. I'm almost done. Okay, touch screens. Uh, uh, can we switch over to the uh, the camera here? Is that possible? Oh. Uh. Do I have to do something? If this was Apple, we could ha do some Siri thing, and I'm sure they'll sort it out. <laughs> okay, so I'll just give an intro in in, in the process. What we're uh, what we're doing here is that we're we're thinking about future development. The XO 1.5 is coming out in a few months um, to to mass production, and the XO 3 will be. I don't know when, maybe a couple of years, but we need to start thinking now because we're, uh, when you're thinking about an all, all touchscreen device, you, you, you need the technology, you need to support multi-touch, you, um, uh, you, you need to think about the user interface, there's a lot of changes that, that need, uh, might need to be done to the, to the user interface. Um, there's a reason why when Apple came up with the iPhone they had such a radically different UI, because they realized that standard desktop interfaces just weren't suitable for a touchscreen device. And if you want proof of that, just look at any any Windows mobile device before version seven. Okay, is this going to be turned on, or yeah, is that yeah, possible? Uh, oh yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Just tell me if it's in the right place. Generally, if you can see it. Yeah. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, okay, so oh, you can't see it. Oh yeah, that's right. What am I thinking? Okay, well, <laughs> I thought you meant you can't see it up there. I didn't mean. I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, what I've got here, I hope you can see it, is it's actually a prototype XO. It's a touchscreen one. It's a one. It's a one seven five. We've got a touchscreen uh, retrofitted into it. Uh, the engineering is not just a case of squeezing a screen in. You actually have to rework the case and. Um, to bring it to bring something like this to production is not is not easy, um, but I can I can do simple things like move my finger around. I could uh, I'm hoping people can see this. I'm trying. I'll pick I'll pick things that that are um, big enough. Uh, that's a game called Implode. I can just do click on things and so the screen's reacting to my finger. And this is this is without any software modification. We haven't done anything to to facilitate touch in software other than add the touchscreen driver. So my finger's just, just working like a mouse. We need, uh, this, this is a, it's, it's, it's a development device where we, we're, we're making these available in the hope, in a limited quantity, in, in the hope that we can get something uh, ready for the XO3 in time. We're trying to accelerate, essentially we're trying to accelerate the development of the XO3. Um, so that's, that, that's that's an example of the kinds of things that that we'd we'd like to see done. So if you're really if you're interested in helping us, please let me know. I can give you a business card, and you can um, you can email me or something, and we can we can make something happen. The um, uh, let's see, we're 
we're porting to Fedora 17, we need to optimize for the ARM architecture, get some 3D graphics going, uh, get GNOME Shell going because this runs GNOME as well. Um, and, and then, uh, like I said, we want, we want to work on the user experience. And then, of course, finally, but, but very, very important, testing and QA. You, can, you can't have anything without that. Uh, so this is what I was referring to before. Uh, we, we are making these available for loan um, or um, where we've got, we've got an order coming in for, um, for a few more, I think about 20. And uh, it, if, you're, if you're interested in uh, getting a hold of one, uh, let me know. Um, they'll be made available for loan with a small deposit, probably about 100 bucks, um, fully refundable. And um, uh, yeah, just let me know. Anyway, question time. No, we've had our questions. Uh, oh, that's the that's the other benefit of the one seven five. They're much cheaper to make. Yep, and that would have happened if um, the U.S. dollar stayed stable. That's that that's the primary reason why they never hit the hundred dollar target. I think that I I actually think though the hundred dollar target they said was mostly aspirational. What they meant was that they were trying to bring the cost down to a point where every where you could afford for every child to have one. Um, that's the point. The XO3, they're, they're saying that's, even going to, that's going to be cheaper even, even again. But the 175 is going to be like 20 or $30 cheaper than the, than the XO1.5, which is pretty significant when you're talking volume, when you're talking about every single child having one. Um, when, we, when we cost things out, we don't, we, don't, we, we don't just quote the cost of the hardware because the hardware on its own is useless. Um, we, we quote the cost of the educational experience. And, when you t and, and with that, you have to think about the long term. So over a, over at least a five-year lifespan, which is the projected lifespan of one of these devices, um, that's for everything. That's including the flash memory and the battery and all of that stuff, and and spare parts for repairs because things break in the process of a child using them. Um, we, uh, we 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 cost out the price per exo three hundred eighty dollars. That also includes, aside from the hardware and the charging rack. That includes teacher training and, enab and enablement, ongoing support, um, the, the cost of the online course, all of that. It's an all-inclusive total cost of ownership. Um, I haven't seen that happening, that sort of thing being quoted by any computer or device manufacturer because, frankly, they're not in the educational space. They don't care. They just want to sell kit and leave. Um, we're a not-for-profit, so we don't, um, we're, we're not thinking about making oodles of money and then buying a yacht somewhere. Though a yacht built out of XO technology would be pretty tough. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, so any other questions? Yeah, it could be, yeah. Pardon? Games? Yeah, you can code whatever you want for it. It runs Linux. Yep. Okay. Sorry about the rush, guys. That um, my, my watch my video, uh, uh, the video of my talk at OSDC was a lot more polished than this. <laughs> no, I just